This is Duke University. Well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here today for, I think, one of the great leaders in American philanthropy. I remember when Nancy Rube, as you know, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, uh, which is a foundation that has led the way uh, in new ways of grant making for uh, foundations all over, all over the country. Uh, and when she first, I was working in Atlantic when she became President of, of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, and she called me up and said she wanted to come one day, and she said, you know, I have this idea about creating efforts that can, where the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation can raise money from other foundations uh, or from individual philanthropists to concentrate on major issues. And I said, I think I took a long pause. <laughs> and I said, you know, that is something that almost no one has ever been able to do. <laughs> I said, it's going to be a long slog. But the fact that she's here today, the fact that she has a track record now of at least three major <laughs> collaborative efforts uh, says something about how skilled she is at what she's doing, how persistent she is with the quality of the vision that she brings to the table. Uh, and so when I, you know, I think it's very funny that two weeks ago when Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, um, uh, sent out his second year annual letter, he listed a group of foundations. He said that Ford has now decided it's going to start giving much more operating support rather than targeted program support uh, to, uh, to its grantees. And, and, in, and there was a list of 10 other foundations there that have decided to do the same kind of thing, including the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. Well, where it started was the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. And what you're going to find out, I think, today is what, what, what uh, Nancy did in trying to shape, reshape a foundation that was a traditional grant uh, proposals receiving foundation into a foundation that turned, the, it turned it upside down. And instead of receiving proposals indiscriminately from foundations in particular program areas, they go out and find people. They find organizations that are succeeding, that have the potential to go significantly higher to scale, and they figured out the way of making it work. So Nancy, welcome. We love having you here. You. Uh, and we all look forward to it. Now, why don't you start the, with that question. Talk about the paradigm, the new paradigm of grant making that the Edmund McConnell Clark Foundation is doing. OK, well, first of all, thanks, everyone, for coming. And it's, it's wonderful to be here. And Joel, thank you for your, your kind words. Um, and I'm looking forward to our, to our dialogue. So I'm not going to go through Edna McConnell Clark Foundation's whole history, but I'm happy to spend time on that if that's of interest to anyone that's here. But essentially, we were founded in 1969, and for probably about almost three decades, our, most of our work was predominantly in the systems reform area. And we were probably giving away maybe $25 million a year on average in five different program areas, making maybe two to 300 grants with that $25 million. I'll just fast forward to um, 1999 when my predecessor, Mike Balin, was hired to come and lead the foundation. At that time, our board was really asking questions about, well, how do we know the work that we're doing in these five different programmatic areas working on major systems changing strategies is making a difference. And we didn't really have a good answer to that question. And so the board really was interested in change and it was interested in figuring out that, um, and I should just add that we still have Clark family members on our board. Our board operates very much as a family foundation. It's able to make decisions if it needs to on a weekly basis. So we're not, um, we're still kind of, I, I, we're very founder-led, um, I would say, still in terms of our culture. So but the board was, was wanting change, and it was really wanting to know, how do we know that our dollars are having an impact? And so we, I won't go through the whole process that we went through to kind of look at that question, but we ended up deciding to focus in one programmatic area, and we picked disadvantaged youth, um, particularly the population of young people that are most likely to drop out of 
school, end up in prison, are in and out of the foster care system on the older age of the continuum, nine through transition to adulthood, about 25. So one programmatic area. And we were really interested in finding evidence-based strategies on the ground that were serving real, you know, serving kids, direct, more direct service oriented, that we could then help scale up in order to ensure that more young people in this country could actually benefit from what was working on the ground. And the process of figuring out, well, how do we do that in a way that's really robust led us to actually change the whole methodology of our grant making. So we ended up um, deciding we would make larger investments in a smaller number of organizations. So we went from a foundation that was giving $25 million away to about 200 to 300 organizations, as I said, to one that was, um, you know, our current portfolio is maybe about 20 organizations. And we're actually, with the aggregations that we're running now, we're investing a couple hundred million dollars a year in those 20 organizations. So, you know, we're, we're, we're 12 years out from where we, where we first started, but the, the path to getting there was one that was really driven by a desire, I think, on the part of our trustees to ensure that we could see a better path to how our dollars, our investments, were really making a difference in the lives of young people in a concrete way. Um, as we went through the process of, of changing the methodology, we were really interested in you know, the problems that nonprofits in this country that are delivering these services have in being effective. So even when you find something that's really working, as many of you in this room know, because I, I notice there are a lot of practitioners here, you're really challenged with bringing the, the capital together in a way that can actually help you make a difference. And so part of what we tried to do in building our methodology was we, we decided that the whole process of um, the way in which most grant seekers get funding in and of itself has is, is got some real challenges to it. So we decided we would get out of the proposal writing business and instead ourselves build a capability where we could actually do what we call sourcing where we actually look at the field of organizations and try to figure out, okay, well, what's really making a difference out there and have in-house and in partnership with consultants the capability to really know what leaders are making a difference, what organizations on the ground are, what they're doing. And we then actually go out, as Joel was saying, and essentially solicit our own, and we don't, I wouldn't call them proposals, but we enter into due diligence processes with, with programmatic strategies and organizations that we're interested in learning more about. So that whole process of um, the way in which we found our investments was very, very different, actually required very different skill sets, et cetera. And then um, we determined that, the, that we, a, a core part of the, part of the methodology was um, figuring out how we could ensure that, that organizations we were supporting were actually delivering against what it was that they intended to deliver on. And so we build, built a performance measurement system that was, is really the heart of a lot of what we've done where we're helping organizations put together their own business plans. And 12 years ago when we started this, this was not normal. Today, a lot of nonprofit organizations, as you well know, have business plans. Well, this was um, pretty radical at the time, and we entered into a partnership with the Bridgespan Group that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We were actually their first client, and it was really with our grantee portfolio that they did their first business plans in the nonprofit sector, and we together learned how to actually do business planning, which is now normal. But the whole heart of the business plan was really to help the nonprofit um, who had a, you know, basically have a roadmap for how do I get my vision executed on, and how can I hold myself accountable to performance against that plan, and then that roadmap has created, created the basis for, for us to invest. And we started building that methodology in 1999 through a pilot strategy, and now it's just grown to be kind of normal in how we're doing our work, and, and many other foundations are also investing in this way. So you, well. have a, you have a loose list of informants around the country, in the, depending <coughs> on what you're looking for. They nominate organizations to you all. You then sift them and decide which ones look most promising. And out of the mix, you then 
invite some of them to come in and have discussions with you, or you go out to meet them where they are, talk with them, and then you, uh, you, how, do you, how, you how do you pick people? One of the first ones that you did, I think, was the Harlem Children's Zone, yeah. right? How did, that, how did that unfold at the beginning? Well, that's not the best example for how it un unfolded, just because we had had a prior relationship with them, and I would say, in a way, everything we've ever learned, we've learned from the Harlem Children's Zone. So <laughs> Tell us about what you learned. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would just say, in general, we actually we do a lot before we ever have a conversation with an organization. So we do extensive research using documents and third-party information through informants, analyzing 990s, looking at, you know, there's you know, so much information available now. So we will do a lot before we ever pick up the phone and have conversations. So that was the case in, you know, when we first started this work 12 years ago and the way, and still today. Um, so you want me to talk about the Harlem Children's Zone? Talk a little okay. bit. Everybody knows about the Harlem okay. Children's Zone. It's not worthwhile saying a few words about that. Yeah, so, so Edna McConnell-Clark, prior to 1999, had had a long-standing relationship with the Harlem Children's Zone. And I actually, when I came to the Clark Foundation, that's a whole other story, which we don't not spend time on right now, but I ran what was our New York Neighborhoods Community Development Program. And when my predecessor came on board, and he was really interested in doing more work with direct service organizations and really figuring out how can we um, improve our, our philanthropy so that we can actually help organizations in, in a more productive way, we piloted a lot of that work in the context of the New York Neighborhoods Program. So when, we ca when it came time to building a small pilot of organizations that we were going to experiment with doing something like business planning with, we, Harlem Children's Zone was one of those organizations that we did that work with. We also went through an extensive process of doing what I just described, the sourcing and the due diligence to select that portfolio of organizations, but we put them in the mix. They would have, they met all the criteria that we were looking for in terms of having a leader and a board with a really compelling vision for growth and really challenged with how they were going to actually achieve that vision and working with the population of young people, most importantly, that we were most interested in working with. And so um, in, in 1999, with Bridgespan and the leadership team at Harlem Children's Zone, they built their first business plan. And that, that plan, and I think what we learned through that experience, I mean, I think Bridgespan in particular, and we learned that you know, a lot of the private sector methods for doing business planning did not apply very well in the nonprofit sector. And we were fortunate that um, Jeff Canada was absolutely clear about what he wanted to get done. <laughs> So I think what we learned was that we were only going to be effective if we were actually working with leaders like Jeff that actually could talk back to us. They could say, you know what, those three research paths you want to go down, they might be really intellectually interesting to you, but they have nothing to do with what it's going to take for us to actually execute on the ground in Harlem. And so they really helped us and Bridgespan get good at figuring out how do we actually do the business planning work. And I think we learned that it's really important to um, be working in partnership with leaders that really have a clear vision and aren't necessarily um, sort of twisting their vision in relationship to what we think might be um, the most important thing. So the goal of on. that first conversation, once you've identified an organization you want to work with, the goal really is to seek, reach some kind of agreement, mutual agreement, with the organization and the board, taking account of what they want to do and testing it against what, what, what your goal is for them and reaching agreement on both the goal and strategy and also, uh, also performance benchmarks. Yeah, I mean, I know. Yeah. When do you decide what your goal is for them? Well, I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's what. Well, yeah. let me. That's good. Good question because what I was going to say is we. That I think is the heart of what is different about our whole investment approach, which is we do not impose a goal on the organization that we're investing in. So the whole idea is, is we're really trying to look for an organization whose programmatic strategy 
already has an evidence base. It actually has gone through, and we're setting a very high bar in the context of where we're focusing our portfolio. So we're looking for organizations that have third party evaluation, validation that what they're doing programmatically really makes a difference. We're looking for organizations who don't just have a vision for what it is that they want to do, but they actually have a track record for having already managed growth. They've already taken their organization from one stage of development to, to the other. And so we've got a set of criteria that we're looking for related to leadership, related to what we call um, programmatic evidence and organizational capacity. And, and so we're looking for all of that. And we are, what we want to try to do is help those leaders actually then execute on their next strategy for growth. And so we don't come in and impose here's what we, what we want. And this is really challenging because most nonprofit organizations are used to the funder, particularly foundations, coming in and making and imposing that. So a lot of the conversation is trying to convince folks that we don't actually have an agenda. Right. <laughs> um, and part of why we like due diligence versus proposal writing is proposal writing is really an opportunity to tell the funder exactly what, what it is that you think the funder wants to hear. Right. Whereas due diligence um, really gives an, uh, us an, an opportunity to really see what's seriously going on in the organization. So for example, we'll look at things like board meeting minutes, and we will sit through board meetings. Right? That's really different conversation <laughs> than you know, what it is that I might write in a proposal. Or we'll really sit down with the financial, you know, the CFO and the finance team, and we'll really get into the finances. That's really different than how you complete my budget, you know, form of my proposal. So that whole dynamic, as many of you know, is just so not the normal way that funders and nonprofits interact. So a lot of our conversation is about really trying to convince folks that you know we don't have an agenda. And a lot of where we get into trouble is when we don't have, where we think, when we typically decide not to invest is when we don't believe that the leadership team really is able to fully execute against its own vision, where we feel like they're not ready or that they couldn't, aren't going to be compatible with our investment style, where we actually want to be in like a truth-telling conversation, like tell us what the real problems are so we can actually figure out what we could do to be helpful. And that's challenging. But, you do, but that process does yield some kind of agreement on what benchmark performance benchmarks are, yes? Yes, it absolutely does. And we use the business planning process I would say our bet the, when we get it most right is when we use the business planning process to make the determination of the performance metric. So basically, the business planning process is where the board of trustee, the board of that nonprofit is basically approving the business plan, and along with the business plan comes a set of performance metrics that that board and that leadership team own. And then we're structuring our investment against their performance metrics. Right. So, that's, that's, and, and I think we've been, we've, we're, we're at this point, we're pretty good at this. We're really helpful, I, I, I think, for the most part. Um, you know, there have been plenty of times where we weren't helpful, but we've, we, this, um, the experience for many boards of having the opportunity to then have a set of performance metrics that they might not have had or, in as robust a way is is a lot of the feedback we get when we do our evaluations is that this is incredibly valued because it creates a better um, dialogue between the board and the management teams and many of the organizations that we're working with. Well, take one of the others. I'd say say a few words um, about either the nurse family partnership or uh, or the uh, uh, youth villages as an yeah. example, uh, because it, it maybe one of those is a for. Uh, uh, characteristic example of, of how you go about doing things that, rather than starting with an organization. Sure. Like okay. Tom okay. So, for example, I mean, Youth Villages is a great example um, because I remember the day when two folks on my team, Woody McCutcheon and David Hunter, came back from their first visit to Youth Villages in Memphis, Tennessee, and they you know, thought we had struck gold, <laughs> essentially. 
because they were so compelled by um, the leadership team and the, the, the program that Youth Villages was running with young people who um, are in, in foster care and um, essentially really challenged with staying in foster care and typically ending up in juvenile justice or really in trouble. And so they had done a lot of research. We had been, we have, you know, our sourcing team had been doing a lot of research trying to find, you know, what are the best practices in this country for working with older age youth in foster care. And particularly um, young people that are aging out of the foster care system or young people that are being put in institutionalized care versus being able to stay at home. And through the research, we discovered this organization, Youth Villages, in Tennessee that we had never heard of. And we had you know, collected a lot of data. We had gotten their 990s. We knew a lot before Woody and David went down and made that site visit. And they came back just incredibly compelled by what they saw. And I think, you know, um, you'd have to have Youth Villages tell the story, but typically it, an, an organization like themselves is getting a phone call from us saying, you know, hi, we're the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, and you know, we, this is what we do, and we have been doing some research on you, and we would like to enter potentially into, into a due diligence process with you where we would take a deeper look at what it is that you're doing programmatically and organizationally. And that's a pretty exciting phone call to get. Um, and, Challenging, too. Yeah, and it's a little scary. And so the first visit is an opportunity for us to explain who we are, what the due diligence process will look and feel like, and then for us to get a sense of the dynamic with the leadership team, and then most importantly, to really look at the program on the ground. And we try to blend in our, in the team of folks that's going out and doing this work, we're trying to blend two different kinds of expertise. So and it's we really have struggled with getting this right over the years, um, but we're trying to blend the expertise of people that have been there and done that, so people who've actually been CEOs of organizations and struggled with all of the leadership challenges that all of our grantee CEOs are struggling with and have managed boards and have managed organizational change with programmatic expertise to really understand when we look at a program, you know, why is it that what Youth Villages is doing with youth that are transitioning out of foster care that much better than something else? So how do we know it's good when we see it? And we don't try to make all of that at the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. We have strategic partnerships with other consulting firms or researchers. We have an evaluation advisory group that looks at all of our due diligence analyses and all of our business plans anal analyses and all of the evaluation work that we do. And we could never make all of that. And we've tried to stay pretty lean and mean as we're doing this. So um, the process would be, just to finish on with, the, with your question, um, once we've done that initial visit, then we'll enter into a longer due diligence process where we'll look more deeply at the program, at the rest of the leadership team, at the board, at their finances, their organizational capability, and then we're also really looking for compatibility with us around this dynamic that we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, can we be in a truth-telling conversation and are we going to be able to actually add value um, if, given whatever the, the dynamic is. You can come up with questions if you have at any point, but I'm going to keep driving it. Uh, but yes, yes, Amy, sure. <coughs> I'm fascinated by the shift you've made from many grants uh, to many organizations. How has it changed the relationship with the grantee team and the amount of staff that you need in your organization and their capabilities and um, the types of roles that you've had to put in place? I mean, it's interesting. The numbers have not, the fundamental numbers haven't really changed. But, and actually, we're a little bit bigger now than we were um, a couple of decades ago because we've actually had a lot of growth with this current strategy. So, but the skill sets are very different. So, I think the skill set of in the past, which I think is, is very classic in many institutional foundations, but not all, is we were really trying to hire the programmatic expert who could figure out what is the most innovative thing we can do in child welfare, for example. 
So we're hiring like really smart people in child welfare and really smart people in education. And in our strategies, we were really hiring people that were interested and capable and had experience in the, in the public sector and running our systems change strategies. So if you looked at the bios of a lot of um, really amazing folks who worked at EMCF when I first came there, these are folks, many of whom have worked in government, served in government, and um, really had the deep programmatic expertise. And we changed that. You know, th that expertise was not, this, was not the expertise that you need to go in and assess the potential scalability of a programmatic strategy and the appetite of a leadership team in a nonprofit to, and cap not just appetite and capability to, to scale. So over time, we really shifted, shifted that work. And I'll just say the way we, the, the, you know, change is never easy. So I, I would not say we had a, you know, a, it was not an easy change process to go through. Um, it might have been easier if we were really clear, like that we knew we needed the different skill sets. But, you know, we had a period, and I'm sure many of you that have managed organizational change have these periods as well, where you, where you kind of think you can do both things and you're really invested in ensuring that you, you know, you, you like what you were doing. So it's, you want to keep some of that. So what we, the way I would, I think we ended up with more of a classic prototype change strategy where we built a pilot within the foundation where we modeled out this work. And then the board liked it a lot. We liked it a lot. And then we built a business plan for how we were going to scale it up and wind a set of other things down. But the fundamental skill sets which are just really different. Can you mention, are you using outsourced or consultants uh, as a way of augmenting your staff rather than having that staff in-house? And it would seem your, your different approach would require more people, which is great. Yeah, I mean, when we first started this, it was myself and a team of people, three people from the Bridgespan group. And that was what it was for, you know, three years. So, and I don't, you know, we didn't, and I, I'm a really big believer in, in using consultants um, when you don't know what you want. <laughs> because when you're figuring something out, you want to be in a space where you can kind of figure it out. And we got great work done because we were, you know, basically figuring it out. And then we knew what we needed. We thought we knew what we needed. I mean, we, we may, we, it's been a work in progress getting that right. Believe me, I've made a lot of mistakes figuring out how to get that right. And still today, I mean, with uh, some of the new work that we're doing within our capital aggregation strategy, we're thinking about how we augment our current skill sets in that area as well. So again, relying on consultants to help us figure that out. So and, go back to you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you had a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the area, the space in which you do grant is in an area where there's so many different nonprofits making efforts to make changes. You know, we talk about you know, incarcer incarceration to education and all yeah. that. Um, so it sounds to me like what you are interested in is helping those who have been around enough, long enough to have had some successes and have strong enough base of leadership and all in place, mm -hmm. then you'll help them go to, so their strategic plan, maybe their five-year strategic plan, and now they're in the second five years of it, and you're going to help them in the third of that next five years or something, so they really have to already be really, really strong and making some something that you'll believe them enough, believe in them enough to take them to the next 15 years. Um, are there enough of them around that are that, at that place where you could even see yourself? Um, the short answer is no. Yeah. Um, and I mean, just to step back from it, I think the, the vision and the reason why we started doing this work in 1999 and while we're still doing it and we feel like we barely moved the needle on this at all is because in the end in order to actually solve but like I think what we believe is that there really are solutions that exist for this population of young people and part of the challenge that we have in this country is not investing in the things that are working in a robust enough way to actually help them get to enough scale 
to really s help us seriously move the needle on some of the problems that we have. And so the thought was find those things that are working and invest in, and over time it's, we've been, you know, we, think, we thought we were making big investments in 1999. They were certainly not big enough. We think we were making big investments two years ago. They were not big enough. So we're increasingly seeing the need to bring more capital together against the things that are really working. And at the same time, there's the challenge of you know, the, how hard it is to get to the point where you could even absorb the capital because you're so challenged doing what you're doing, meeting the payroll, you know, even when you have something that's working. So there is a real challenge that we have, I think, in this country of, of how do we actually get behind the things that are working and make big enough investments in them to help them scale up. And so but you, but while you we've take, had that you, vision of doing it, we, it's not like you know. There's a huge pipeline of those opportunities. There's right. not, and that's I think there's you know that's a whole other conversation. But, to, why there but, isn't. but if I remember correctly, the Harlem Children's Zone has significantly grown in its reach of to clients since you all started with it. You've taken it much greater scale than it was when you first started there, right? Oh yes, absolutely. Well, and so in a sense, you're demonstrating with that organization and the kinds of things they're doing it already that you can in fact reach more students more or more young people more effectively uh, and which becomes the possibility for it receiving large public funds at some point. Yes, I mean that's that's been our vision and we've stuck to it and I think if you look across our portfolio um, we've got a number of investments that we've been sticking with that are continue to get results and continue to scale and continue to really move the needle on the issues that they're working on and are capable of us making, us even, making more, even bigger more. investments in. And I think the lesson of the last you know, decade is that we've got to, not just we and McConnell Clark, but we collectively need to figure out how we can get there faster if we want to actually solve problems in a bigger right. way. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So our funding our funding rounds tend to be three to five years because they're typically, as I said, against business plans and business plan life cycles tend to be three to five years. So we don't have a you know a set. It's got to be three years or you know sometimes we'll make a two year investment in something. So it's typically against as Joel and I were discussing performance metrics that are tied to a plan. And then always with whatever investment we're making, there's always an exit plan that we think about when we first, or I should say we, we try to have an exit plan when we first make the investment. So it's part of the truth-telling, transparent conversation. So we'll go into a round of investment and say, and again, it's performance based. So if you don't get, you know, if they don't, if they're not able to to get where they want to get in this period, we might not continue our investment. Um, so we have, over the course of the last twelve years, probably exited about sixty-five, between sixty to seventy percent of everything that we started with. So we're exiting lots of things all the time. Are they um, are most of them for not? incapacity to get performance benchmarks or are, are there some that you've exited because they've gotten so good on their own that they don't need you anymore? Exactly. So it's <laughs> mostly, well, it's more about, um, so we've tried over the years to be increasingly focused because we're, we're just, we, we've limited dollars on, again, we're trying to find what are those programmatic strategies that we're investing in that really can have this, the ultimately the systems changing effect that can at scale really move the needle on a particular problem. And so we've, I think, fund, funded incredibly terrific organizations who themselves are, have made enormous progress but might not be, have the scale potential or might not get the evidence base. Or, you know, so, so typically we're making a decision if I had a dollar to spend, even though they're doing a really great job, I got to spend it over here versus continuing to spend it over there. 
And so there's a discipline to how our board is actually making investment decisions that's competitive within the context of the current portfolio. So we're constantly looking at our portfolio's performance against the pipeline of potential new ideas and trying to be disciplined about that. How did you, you, you had a question? Yeah, I mean, I'm practical about all this, and I believe, I think, in particular, but what I really <laughs> what is your definition of an ideal community in which to go find people? I hear you saying, mm -hmm. well, there are not a lot of them out there. Well, there are a lot of something out there, because almost every community has something of trying to work in this field. Yeah. So my question is, are you looking for the big boys in the big cities? Are you looking, what, uh, you know, in the wild and exuberant days of the early attempts by foundations to do things yeah. in the social welfare and other fields to go out and pick any five people and say, we're going to change the world, and they give them the money. Yeah. Now the question is, where are you going? What do you think is adequate base for what you're going about? Yeah, so we're looking nationally, and again, we've got this really high bar on evidence. Yeah. So that just takes a lot of things off the, off the map on that basis, and we're looking for scale potential. So we're typically looking for um, you know, operations that are multi-region. So that also takes a lot of things off, off the table. So, yeah. One other question. I mean, They'll get what you've got when they get it, that is, when they understand and come out of the program. What happens when you say you ain't going to get it anymore? They built themselves up to a certain plateau. They've done it not because you weren't giving them money. They've mm -hmm. done it because you have been. Now you're not going to give it to them. Are you, when you walk away, are you saying you now have an adequate new base of financial support? Or are you saying it's a great experiment? I hope some social scientists translates that to the federal program. I mean, I'm well, no, I mean, I think this is, we, we like have a lot of sleepless nights over this issue. So I would not want to claim that we have this right at all. Mm -hmm. I don't think we do. But what we've been working on over time is when we do a business, when we work with an organization, for example, um, let's just, like our, the best investments that we've made, we are, and this has been very important with the rounds of capital aggregation that we've done, which we haven't talked about yet. We're getting there. But, okay. Yeah. So, We're gonna get there, just one second. Um, <laughs> so, I'll, I mean, let me talk about two examples, because in our, I think in our, in the work that with, where we are really working on scaling strategies, in the business planning work that we do, we're really careful to think about we're helping an organization go from A, you know, to K, right? And we try to work with them on their finance, on their fin financial model, so that. And typically, those organizations that we would be investing in anyway, they have some mm -hmm. form of a ongoing, renewable, reliable. I, I hate the word sustainable because nothing is sustainable in the nonprofit sector, really. But more sustainable <coughs> funding stream that they're going to tap into as part of their scaling strategy. And what we're trying to do is provide what we think of as growth capital, which comes in and helps them be better positioned to tap that strategy. So for example, an organization like Youth Villages, which we were just talking about, as they go into a new state and they're able to tap public dollars in as part of their, as their, their funding stream, they need growth capital that helps them build up the operation, get whatever they need to get done. And if successful, there's a financing stream that comes in. So the idea is when you get from A to K, you still might need more growth capital to continue to grow. But our dollars, in a sense, get taken out by those more renewable, reliable, more sustainable, but not entirely, funding streams. And so that's the concept. And um, you know, if you go to our website, we have examples of some of these um, business planning strategies that we've put together. I, I do not want to overclaim like we have an answer to this. But that's the discipline we try to go through is to imagine. And this has become very important with our capital aggregation work, where we're helping other investors also participate in these growth capital rounds with us. We need to be able to guarantee folks like, OK, you're going to put in 
help put in up front some of growth capital and you know in five years you don't it, it's not you don't have to keep investing in this so that so that's the idea um we've been able to do that me, in there's some, some suckers who are supposed to keep doing it since you all aren't but there's some who are been supporting these people who are going to continue to support them. well there's ongoing i mean yeah, so I think the concept is we're trying to bring in growth capital, which would you would not, which is helping you go from here to there. But we're trying to be careful that it's not your, we're not replacing operating support, right? We're trying to be careful about that. So you're going to still have to raise operating support and do a set of things. When we exit, we try to give a big ramp and we do a lot of, we put a lot of money out when we're exiting, you know, over a couple years. It's not a perfect answer at all. Um, and we and it's yeah. and it's it, it's it's not easy for the organizations that we're exiting. Kelly. So this is what you're talking about sounds really very exciting, and I was wondering if your in if your definition of scaling up, whether the public policy and things ever comes into play. So let's just take new villages for example. So let's just say you take it from Memphis and you scale it up to the entire state of Tennessee, but then there's still Arkansas and Mississippi and the other states that do it, and, and whether the happens in those places if you villages has developed a truly effective model of dealing with foster care and whether the other states will do it will depend on policy decisions they make and they might not be spending money on foster care in ineffective ways whereas the villages might be an effective way so do you ever take on the public policy of things to try to make these things contagious in a positive way and scaling up by having other places do it through policy yeah so so like a major part of Youth Village's scaling plan is working on a policy strategy. So it's baked into their business plan, which we're investing in. So we, do, we, we, we try to do everything through the, the mm -hmm. leadership of the grantee team that we're working with rather than ourselves you know, running a policy, uh, you, uh, you know, investing in an ancillary way in policy work. We could, I mean, we debate this all the time. Maybe we should, there could, so we stay open to it, but for the most part, like that, they can't scale without that strategy. So it's fundamental to what they're doing, and they have to have the muscle. They have to build their own muscle to be able to do that, to be able to get the results. Jerry. So the related question that Joel talked about, examples that can begin to move public resources at some point, it's related to the scalability question, the last question, and you touched on scalability. So I'm wondering to what extent this is weighed as part of your process. If you are about to fund an organization, dealing in a particular area, but there are millions of children in a state that, mm -hmm. for example, might be affected by this. Yeah. To what extent do you weigh the likelihood of success of this grantee in changing policy in ways in a state or a region that will affect all of those children? Yeah. It's a scalability. In other words, if you prove how you can do something beautifully in one or two cities, but the power structure of the state for, or the region or whatever, for one reason or another, is resistant to models of this kind, to what extent do you ask your grantees what their strategy might be to change public attitudes or mm -hmm. governmental awareness of how their success might yeah. be scaled up? Is that part of what you weigh? Yes, and I would say I think we this is bec becoming a much bigger part of our, of our, of our current work, mm -hmm. right? So right, I think we've learned a lot over the last decade about thinking that one can you know get three great models in three great states <laughs> and they'll be automatically and, adopted and then they're going to be i mean it's just that's not going to happen right <laughs> so we're increasingly part of the part of our lens is not only on the programmatic evidence base now but we are really looking at um, potential for scaling in a much more a deeper analytical way than we've ever looked at it before. And so if there isn't that roadmap for how you really think about your scaling, and that may or may not involve a public policy strategy okay, or a strategy. Involved. If the ability to scale up depends on public understanding of the need to scale up, <laughs> do you weigh what the strategy might be to change public awareness of the problem so therefore there can be more support Scaling up. Well, we're certainly seeing now in a lot of the, the new planning work that we're doing with organizations that are working on scaling, much more tension going into communication strategies and advocacy and, and policy work. 
And I mean, it's a little bit of you know a full circle for us at, at Clark, because obviously you know you heard my whole story about how we kind of got out of the systems reform area. But I think the difference though is that we are not doing that ourselves. What we, we, we're trying to do is bring to the table with our strategy consultants, you know, folks that are really skilled in the public policy arena or really skilled at communications that can serve as advisors. And again, it's trying to add value to, for that leadership's management team and they're figuring out what their communication strategy is and that's part of their business plan and we're investing in it. But the thought process has got to be there. And you know, we're trying to, it's a work in progress. <laughs> so, but I agree that it's really fundamentally critical to any scaling strategy. Kristen. Yeah. So my memory from my reporting. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, and, and reading Joel Cook and the new book by Dale Brusikoff, Mark Zuckerberg, who came from New York School, mm -hmm. the systems change has been something that when foundations have tried it has proved to be quite challenging. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering <laughs> how the, your experience with the systems change strategy within your foundation informed what lessons you took away from that that might have informed your newer approach um, that seems to be kind of sitting in the middle of systems change and letting a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah. That's I mean, for me, the fundamental difference, the fundamental shift at, at Ed McConnell Clark is, is actually less about the shift from systems reform to what it is that we're doing today. Um, because I actually feel, I, mean, I had the benefit of kind of crossing over two generations. I've been there a really long time. I don't know how many years have gone by so quickly, but a long time. And so I've crossed over two generations there. And, and from, from my perspective, our values and actually our aspiration has, is the same. Right? So we've always been about, and the Clark family has always been about, and our board has always been about, really wanting to be sure that we actually, our dollars are both making a difference every day in the lives of really disadvantaged people, especially kids, and that we are having some kind of a systemic effect. That has been important, that's very important in our current work as well. I think the difference is our methodology, the grant making methodology. So there's just a fundamental difference in um, an organization that is hiring people whose job it is, is to figure out what do I do in child welfare and then run a program strategy that gets that set of things done to get change versus our job is to figure out who out there in child welfare is running something that's really working and how do we put our dollars behind investing in their ability so, to so make they can do change it more. Yeah. so they can do more. And I think both actually are viable strategies to pursue in philanthropy. So, but we've made a choice to try in this in, incarnation, I think our board feels positively about the results that we're getting to be more of a, to, to think of ourselves more as investors. Right? Our job is to be great at investing. We gotta be great at picking, we gotta know what, you know, and we gotta be good at actually putting the dollars out that can, in a productive way. And this is just, it's, it's, it's so basic really, but in a way that is one of our biggest problems. I think, you know, for those of us working on the practitioner side, it's like how do you get the funding to come in in a way that's actually productive for you? So, like that's what we you know, are trying to be great at, which is different than trying to be great substantively, programmatically at a given thing. So I think and it's- I don't know if that that's is- No, that's helpful. Okay. And I want to get on the table before it gets too late, uh, the, the, the notion of the growth, growth capital aggregation pilots, mm -hmm. which I've always thought was a not particularly felicitous way of describing it, but nonetheless, it does describe it in detail. <laughs> If you pay attention to each word, each word, growth, capital, aggregation, and pilot, then it you makes sense. You can take the pilot out now because we're sort of done piloting, <laughs> done, it, but yeah. Piloting. Well, okay. we'll talk about, you know, you've now done two of them and you're in the works on a third at this point that's different. Talk a little bit about that and okay. about what you're aiming to do with that. So, um, I mean, in a nutshell, just to give the little bit of the history on sure. why we did this. When we started the work in the beginning, we really believed that if we helped an organization like Harlem Children's Zone 
or youth villages or any organization have a, have a business plan, let's say over five years. And there was, part of the vision was we would, that the grantee would then be able to upfront raise the funding that it needed, the full funding, all the growth capital that, that it needed over the life of that five-year plan so that they could actually focus on executing against the plan and not having to chase the money every year and determine, well, maybe I can do this and maybe I can't do this depending on what funding I have. So people following that concept, very simple concept. And we believed at the time, let's imagine there was $20 million of growth capital to raise over a five-year plan, and we, and the McConnell-Clark, was putting in a third of that. We, and there were performance metrics attached to that plan and this extensive due diligence that we had done. We believed that the grantee was going to be like superly well-armed to go out and raise the rest of that funding. And it really did not <laughs> happen that way. <laughs> And I think we were really crazily naive about this on some level. It's not that the money didn't get raised, but it was that the money didn't get raised up front in year one, so you knew what you had in hand and you could just and you could execute. Right. And so that created a problem for us because then we were kind of in this challenging place where we could we say, or do we have performance or we don't have performance? How do we fully assess the performance that we have if we haven't really been able, like we're doing it with one arm tied behind our back still. So um, actually, when I moved into the CEO role, I said to the board at that point, like I, you know, and I had Mike to really build the strategy. I was the operational person, the programmatic person building, and I deeply believed in it. But I actually didn't know if we could succeed, if we couldn't actually do something to change that dynamic. So and you raised so the money yourself. We then decided <laughs> that we would really work with the grantee to try to raise the money. And that we wouldn't consider our part of the, the grant or the investment, like it, it, we might approve it, but we wouldn't actually have a deal unless all the money was raised. So like go, we didn't start go until all the money was raised. And in the first, the fir and this was like a really big idea at the time. Um, we started with a pilot, as Joel said. It was $120 million across three organizations. It was right before the downturn. And we did all this work with those three grantees to build like the most compelling business strategies. They were, they were very strong on showing like how your money could be taken out. Raise that money. I, I, and let me just say, I had never raised money before, so I just want to, you know, say that um, Joel did tell me I was crazy, <laughs> um, and we raised that money in nine months. So it was a shocker. It was just a complete shocker, and it had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with the grantee organizations and their plans, and you know, <laughs> relationships and. The fact that we were putting in a third of this. And so that was really powerful. And then the other thing about it is when we went into this, we were we said, well, maybe it's a fund, but it might not be a fund. Well, it was really good that we said that because no one wanted to put their money into a fund. They wanted their money to go <laughs> to, to the percent. organizations. And we said, okay, fine. So we held that aggregation together as, as like a syndicate. It was $80 million that you raised from other, other, other sources. You put up 40, right? We put up 40, yes. Yeah. And you got 80, the total was yes. 100. Yeah. 100. Yeah. Share yeah. who they were, those of us who tried It's public. Them. You can go look on our website. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was from 23, 23 sources. Yeah. We had a minimum. We started with a minimum, which was 5 million, was the minimum. Um, in two of the deals that we did, we achieved that. And in one, we did not. We ended, this was before the downturn, so it was, 2007. 2007. 2007. Yeah. So it was, it was 2000, 2006, 2007 was when we did that. And okay, so that, um, that happened. And then we did another, as Joel said, we did another version. And now this is just a normal part of kind of what we're doing. Um, it's been, I mean, it has absolutely been a slog. It's been really, really, really hard to do. And when we went to do our second, let's call it pilot, which we call, which was, we actually 
became an intermediary for the social innovation fund federal dollars. Anyone follow that? But that's a whole other conversation. But we received, as part of receiving that, that federal money, we then ran an aggregation to match those dollars with other dollars so we could raise all the money that would be needed because the grantees we, would ha we were going to select would have to meet a federal requir requirement of a lot of matching money. So we raised, it was ironically, $120 million there also in a fund. And that was not, again, not a fund. It was a syndicate, but we did raise the money with the notion that a funder would give to the portfolio <coughs> of organizations that we selected versus an one, individual, one, an individual right. deal. Right. That was a big disappointment for me on some level when we went out to do this because I thought that those investors that were part of our pilot who had been part of the three deals that we had done when we said, hey, we're like prepared to take this federal money, it's this big opportunity, the, the, the Social Innovation Fund folks, and you know, it was right, right at the beginning of the Obama administration, are really wanting philanthropy to step up. I really thought that those funders were going to say, wow, you guys are taking a lot of risk. We're really happy with your results, and we'll, of course, <laughs> help you. And I mean, there were two funders from that first round of 23 that participated in the, in second, the, in the yeah. second round. So I had to kind of start from scratch again. And that was, you know, I was really disappointed with that. But on the other hand, it was a great learning opportunity. And it really. Um, You're an optimist, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> you look yeah. at these learning opportunities. Yeah, it was a great learning opportunity. <laughs> so I see that there are questions. Like but. The old donors. Oh, Ginger? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. So when you're getting ready to raise one of your aggregate funds, yeah. are the organizations and their business plans already on the table? Okay. Or do you say we're going to go find organizations and make sure their business plans That's are a on? great segue to what we're going to be doing next. Up until this point, we have... Um, we've gone out and raised money in partnership with grantees that we have selected. And what we learned actually with when we did this, what we called the True North Fund, that was the Social Innovation Fund dollars, that we actually had to have the grantees in place to be able to raise the money. Like that folks in the end were not interested in the aggregated model, like our role in that necessarily. It really mattered in the end the organizations were. So on the other hand though, we have a lot of partners that, we've done a lot of evaluation of the work. A lot of um, investors that we work with really appreciate what it is that we can help them be able to do with their philanthropy. And so we have been with the question of how do we scale up the aggregation model and part of what we're going to experiment with something new that we're working on that we're not quite ready to, it's not no. ready for prime time, um, is to actually work in a partnership with a, a group of philanthropists to build a different kind of a platform where collectively we select the in organizations that we're going to be investing in. And so that'll be a different kind of a strategy. We're still, you know, we're still the operating platform, we're still selecting, but what we have found is that, um, you know, in order, I think, to, I think a couple things. One is we want to scale it up. We want to be able to bring larger amounts of, of capital together. In order to do that, folks need to have more of a stake in, in decision making. And so that's our next experiment is to figure out how can we do that. Ginger, is that? Yes, and I'm just noting how this is different than other um, foundations that aggregate where they say this is our subject area like oceans and give us some money and we'll do something nice with it on oceans. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I should say we run quarterly reporting meetings on every deal that we're doing. So whether it's one of the individual deals that we're doing or with our True North Fund, we, on a quarterly basis, bring the investors together with the grantee organization. So the, the benefit to the grantees, which is, I mean, I, sh I should have said this because this is huge and a big driver for why we did this, is they're receiving the growth, all the growth capital that they need against their plans, and they're making one report because we're managing all the reporting. So everyone is signing on to the same deal, 
and it's one report and they're everyone it's a quarterly conversation about how it's going I mean, of course, there's interaction between some of the investors and the grantees, and we want to support that kind of relationship building. But the whole idea is to, is to create more efficiency, more efficiency in terms of how capital flows, more efficiency in the life of the nonprofit organizations that are doing the work, et cetera. I'd like so, to ask you something yeah. about that that's a little bit of a follow-up to my earlier question, but this is so fascinating, as Ginger said, it's such, uh, so wonderful to hear that you do this kind of planning. As you are rolling out some of these massive efforts, the next one you just described, does the foundation go through a process saying, X is the subject we wish to impact. We would like to impact it either in an entire state or national. And we want our strategy to be that. We want to select grantees that have the opportunity to have a almost not a permanent solution, but a major solution for all the children in a given area. Mm -hmm. That's something I suppose the foundation could have done <coughs> at the beginning if they thought that was their goal, as opposed to looking at projects that might have some incremental impact on that goal. Right, so what we do is we have, we have, what, we have domain frames, right? So we might say, okay, um, older age youth in foster care is a huge concern of ours and the problems of young people as they're transitioning out. Then what we're doing is we're looking for, okay, what's working, where are the, what are the most proven models to get behind? And that's where, and then we're, then we're betting on youth villages because their scaling of their transitional living program could have the potential to actually create a tipping point in this country where you could do something very significant for the 23,000 young people on an annual basis that are in this situation. That are aging out of like aging, aging out, out, out on of, an annual uh, basis. Right. And that's a really, I mean, that, that's like, we should be able to do something. That is a small, from a scale perspective, like, we gotta figure, we, we can't get that one solved, you know? So that's kind of the frame. What we don't do, there's so few, um, so that's, that's an ideal um, example in some sense. Now, for example, in another domain, you might not have the equivalent of a, of a really scalable strategy. And so there we might fund a couple different um, organizations and their strategies and work on evidence building to see if we can get the evidence and the potential for scalability. But we really avoid, and I, I mean, I get a pushback from this from some from our from some of our investor partners on this. Most foundations will say, many of the larger institutional foundations will say, like, what we want to do is, you know, build the continuum of programs in I don't know, what K twelve or whatever it is, and they're working on a programmatic strategy for how to do that. That's not what we're doing. Like we're, we're saying there's so few things out there that have the scale potential that are working. Let's just get those things and then use a really competitive analytical lens to see if those things could actually move the needle on some element of the problem. You rather than thinking we could fully solve everything that you could solve in child welfare. Yes. There's a woman in the back that is just dying. I'm sorry to interrupt, but she's just okay. But she's raised her hand like four times. We oh, keep okay. missing her. I, can, so I can't I just, see her. She's I, I gave her. her. You can't see her, so I'm, I apologize. Oh God, yeah. I just defend. I, I just have I have a question on the mechanics side because you're, you're talking about a, a transition on you know in terms of what the foundation, what a foundation is doing from giving money away to having to raise it. So. What's your what's your staff look like? You talk a lot about having consultants. Are you looking to others to fill that essentially the development fund, fundraising role to get partners to your aggregation fund, or did you find that staff had to shift to that um, role? And is that uh, also kind of evolving because you're kind of changing your model? So I was actually saying to Joel earlier, um, we've hired zero development staff. I mean, and, and it's a little, so um, 
we have changed our skill sets to be able to do that. I should not say zero. I did hire a person as a partner who is um, helping to manage our aggregations, and he helps with relations. Chuck. Chuck Harris, who um, is the head of our capital aggregation work, who helps, shares the relationship management of many of our um, investor he had good experience. He was at Goldman Sachs as a partner there before. Um, <laughs> so we, he and I share those relationships, but we do not at the moment. And we, and I would just say it's it's like embedded into our work, right? So just like we're reporting to our board, we're reporting to the investor. So that muscle around reporting, a lot of the systems that you need to to report and manage those relationships, we already had them because we kind of have that built in already. And then we've built more, um, you know, we're managing these meetings of the investors. And so, and the fundraising is not an ongoing, it's like, it's not like we're going out and fundraising every day. It's very focused against very specific objectives related to the grantee strategies and the deals that are coming forward. And so the answer is we actually do not have a, te a development team. Um, it doesn't mean that we would, we're not going to need to augment our capacity at some point in this area. We probably will. But my own feeling about this is that most of this business is relationship-based. And you know that's the nature of how we've built it and probably the nature of how we have to manage it. Say a word about the, uh, the project that you're doing in California with the Hewlett Packard uh, and other foundations there. Uh, which is a variant of the model that you're currently using. Yeah, so we have a, a, a we, we have, as I, we're talking a lot about you know, making big bets on scalable strategies, we've also over this whole time been really concerned about how do you build the um, evidence base and the organizational capacity um, for organizations that are not quite ready for scaling because they're really working still on improving their programs and kind of getting it right before they think about their next stage of development. And so we launched a, a project um, called Propel Next, which some of you may have heard about. And there we, we, we do like to pilot things. We did a kind of a pilot <laughs> experiment with that over the last couple of years where we worked with a cohort of organizations that we selected through a competitive process who are together getting training and technical assistance and there's a very big peer learning component where they're really working on building up their performance management systems and working on how they build their internal organizational cultures to become more performance oriented and to have the system's capacity to actually determine whether they're, they can build the evidence base and be more ready for, for growth. It's not entirely growth oriented, so there might, we do have a number of more community-based organizations in that cohort where growth is not necessarily the objective, it's more about quality programming. And we are now um, launching a second cohort in partnership with a group of funders in California. The first cohort was national, so it was with organizations all across the country. This is a regional cohort, and the thought there is we would get more efficiencies and opportunities for um, training and technical assistance, and maybe even scaling up this network of organizations in a regional context. Are all the recipient organizations youth development? Yes. They're all youth <coughs> development? Yeah, they are. Yep. Why did you say Hewlett and Packard? Uh, well, because Hewlett, Hewlett and Packard, both, Hewlett and Packard both foundations are, are involved in it. Yeah. They're involved in it. Can I just and go on that have one question? Is there a profile of funders or are they all sorts? So you probably just answered it. You say Hewlett Packard has been willing to play with you. Are they mostly Orthodox old ones? Are they mostly family foundations? Are they, what, what are their sides? Or individual philanthropists? I think there's or two different. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. In some ways, I think the for the folks, the folks that are that are most interested in seeing us grow the aggregation strategy. Um, where we, let me just, I think it's split, okay? So there's, some of our best partners are definitely individuals or families that are making the decision for whatever reason not to have a staffed up foundation. So we're essentially playing that kind of a role for them. You know, we're bringing investment ideas that are ready to go. They <coughs> piggyback off of our due diligence, et cetera. 
I think institutional foundations have also been great partners where there's programmatic alignment. So their programmatic areas and what we're funding are very aligned and they want to participate because it gives them a great learning opportunity. They see the leverage value in terms of their own portfolio. And we can, you know, and I think we, we also just learn a lot from those partners that have programmatic expertise. So there's, there's a range um, of, of different types. And that was a surprise to me, too. So. Interesting. Yeah. Laura? Yeah. We've mostly done, mo most of our structures have been in the grant forum. However, we have looked at debt and we may do more with debt going forward. And we certainly, many of the organizations in our portfolio are the candidates for some of the pay for success and social impact bond financing strategies right now. So they are very much in the mix of that and we're looking at our, you know, toolbox in relationship to those financing opportunities. There is a really important role for debt to play in some instances, but not all when it comes to this these populations of, of have you have you had any direct experience with the social impact bonds at all? Well we are involved um, in I mean let me just say several of our grantees right now are involved in both social impact bonds and pay for success pay for strategies. Sale. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our guys are the go to's for those right. in many states. Right. So, yeah. Um, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something we can't deal with this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Something you can answer for a lot of people. Oh, no, that's not, there's a case, there's a, I mean, Harvard Business School wrote a case on, you know, the challenges that my predecessor went through in, in the change process. So that was very difficult to do um, at the time. Was so. it difficult for him? Yes, it was oh, difficult yes, for him. Oh, yes, it was very difficult for him. Just as a lot of us know, a number of family foundation types who have taken their foundations in really remarkable ways, and then one day the family wakes up and says, hey, you never told me it was going to be like this. They're gone. <laughs> and you can go through the list just in the last 10 years, a fairly long list. Yeah. That's why I was asking. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, I mean, from my perspective, I think that, um, you can think you want change, and then when you're faced with change, it, it just it doesn't always feel so good. So I think that's really what ultimately happened, was in the midst of that, it just was really, really hard. Um, I'm sure, I don't want to speak for Mike, but you know, having been very, very close to him, I think probably he and I would both agree there are lots of things we could have done differently to make it better. But on the other hand, there's just this element of, I think change is really, can be really challenging. Um, but I think, you know, our, I give our board enormous credit for having made the change and continuing to make changes against the ultimate objective of wanting to ensure that what we do makes a difference. And I really appreciate that. Um, I would certainly not be able to have been effective <laughs> without that, so I feel like um, that's really the, the privilege of, of this particular family and this particular board. I met with Mike uh, in New York at his office the day before the board meeting that he had to present this new model to the foundation board, and uh, I can tell you there was a lot of stress in, in <laughs> it, an unbelievable amount of stress in it. And, but what, is, I think what says something about about him and about Nancy and about the family is that while there was stress and while there was a lot of discussion, 
pro and con about the idea of doing this. Uh, ultimately, they did decide to do it, and they've stuck with it. And there's, I think, I, mean, I don't know, because uh, Nancy has never told me that there's any continuing uh, regret at having un ha having done it this way. My sense is that it's just the opposite, that, that they're very, very supportive of what, what, what you're doing. I think that's yeah. right. I, for a board, the way this kind of grant making that we're doing gives a board um, a lot of ability to know whether it's making a difference or not. Yeah. So I think they appreciate that. The aggregation strategy has also been really interesting because I mean it really, I mean I, I love it because it, it, it creates a kind of, the challenge in philanthropy as many of you know is that you ultimately have to create your own accountability. Yes. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, you don't have a market telling you whether you're performing well. So the nice thing about the aggregation strategy is it, it creates a, an accountability within our whole operation. And our board is accountable too, right? Because our board is, in a sense, taking responsibility for the investing of other philanthropists' money, right? So that, that whole system between the investor perspective, our board perspective, and our management team's perspective, and the grantee, that just creates a, a culture of accountability and reflection and, you know, being a, it's like, of course you have to exit something, right? It, it, isn't, it doesn't, and I think that that is super healthy and has, has really helped us. And I think our board appreciates that. Last question here. We're coming up on six o'clock. <laughs> One issue that we've seen again and again in the communities we work with are dealing with issues of race and structural racism mm -hmm. and figuring out how to move into that bravely and support courageous conversations that need to happen and create an accountability in the communities that we're serving. Anything in there that you would like to speak to, I'd be interested in hearing. Hmm. Um, are you talking about it from the perspective of philanthropy's role in that, or are you talking about it in general? Philanthropy's role. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the first challenge, in a first challenge for philanthropy is just how to be in that conversation in real partnership with, with the community. So um, I know, you know, I certainly learned my own, some lessons really the hard way when I ran the New York Neighborhoods work with just the, you know, the issue of like coming in with your goal. And I think that if philanthropy can be a participant, but ensure that those conversations are really being led by the community, it ultimately may be a more productive way to be in the conversations. Because you've got this issue of power that goes along with money that makes it really difficult to be in a conversation about structural racism. So I just think that the sensitivity around the power dynamic has to be really named, and philanthropy has to be able to name that to be able to be in the conversation. So, yeah. Well, alas, we are out of time. Let anybody say who represents the community. Yeah. You really try to work it out all the way. That nobody represents the community. That's a hard single thing. Well, I thank you, Nancy. It's very interesting, very stimulating. What you're doing, I think, is exciting, and you're doing it very well. And we're all looking forward to hearing about the next stage when you decide to announce it in a month or two. But so, thank you very much. Don't hold me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.